been engaged to her daughter. And do you know, very leftist politically. Yeah. After her death, Schelling turned reactionary that's only. True. That's true. It's absolutely right. But I mean, I, and I say this because it's a way of trying to historicize and concretize what we're talking about here. Because what this text is fundamentally about is what are the ways in which we talk about the traumatic, the catastrophic, the monstrous, be it in terms of our individual psyche or be it in terms of our culture, larger civilization. I think it's no accident that the text that I would highly recommend to each and every one of you called The Fragile Absolute. Why is the Christian legacy worth fighting for? You various references in some ways in the, in the text. And he didn't get a chance to read the whole text because he gave me a slightly different text, which I appreciate because it's, it's just so uh, uh, creative. You can see your mind forever moving, building on what, what, building on what I read. Mean. But in that particular text, what I also saw is how easy it is to settle for trite formulations that somehow don't, uh, somehow don't force us, don't compel us to wrestle, wrestle with these very, very dark centers inside of ourselves and inside of our, our society. Now, now, what is the significance of this? Well, one is, is that one has to move backwards in order to move forward. That is to say, if we're going to go back to wrestling with the old problematic of German idealism, what does it really mean to be homeless? What does it mean to acknowledge the ineradicability of the non-rational? What if reality and being itself is impenetrable? What does it mean to actually confront the fact of the intractability of the unfathomable? Is that just empty rhetoric? Not at all. It means the fact that somehow we've got to either learn how to confront and cope with the traumatic or we will forever remain on the surfaces and the move toward the 19th century, toward Schelling, toward German idealism, toward wrestling with forms of alienation and the traumatic and the catastrophic go hand in hand with the return to Mars. Not in any simplistic way. You can see the reading itself. It's, a, it's sophisticated. But all the postmodernist talks that downplay class, that downplay empire, are similar modes of evasion because we don't want to deal with the traumatic core at the very center of our own lives and civilization. And we in America have a very different religious <laughs> profile, as you know. 96% of fellow citizens in this country, my fellow citizens in this country, believe in God. 80% believe Jesus Christ is the Son of God. 51% talk on intimate terms with God at least four times a week. Now you say, well, does it cut deep? Is it just objectified? Are the fundamentalists in some way simply on the surface and not, a, and not a, 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 enacting any kind of authentic conviction? Well, I don't know. When you look at the debate about abortion, you see some pretty deep intensity of people who really believe and in fact, are willing to sacrifice. In fact, they're willing to sometimes confront their enemies, sometimes trash their enemies. Very intense. And there's a sense in which part of the liberal project is just to lower the temperature so that they don't kill each other. Because they're not at each other's throat, in a certain sense. But at the same time, you see, the, 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 the religiosity that you're talking about, so much of it market-driven, as it were, so much of it obsessed with uh, upward mobility, so much of it not really confronting the deeper traumatic core at the very beginning of this nation and, 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 and given its enactment thereafter, does, I think, provide some, some ground for, for what you're saying. I think my question to you in part would be, what would be an example, a constructive, positive, positive example of the kind of belief that you would want to promote? I know that I know that usually it's a certain kind of psychoanalytic practice, and certainly usually it's a certain kind of anti-capitalist practice, or even sophisticated Marxist practice. But I would want to hear a bit more about how that is enacted, where you see it at work in our society, in Slovenia, in Europe, or, or what have you. Uh, so that would be one question. Uh, the second question I want to raise would be the question about the uh, <coughs> About that line on the cross, though, about 
my God, my God, yeah, yeah. why have thou forsaken me? Now, now you know that, that that's Mark 15, 34, and it echoes the first verse of Psalm 22. Uh, that Judaism already has within it a very, very rich tradition of the dormant God, the sleeping God, the absent God, uh, the God that seems to be far removed. In fact, when you look further, for the long in that verse, it says, my God, my God, why is thou forsaking me? Why is thou so far from my call for help, my cry for help? Why does one not hear my words soaring? Now, you see, that kind of talk one does find in Pascal, the they are abscondences. That's very different atheistic talk. You see, that's not Psalm, that's not Psalm 14 chapter. The fool says in his heart, there is no God. That's a very, very different level of discourse. And so the question becomes whether Chesterton is misleading you in saying this is an atheistic moment as opposed to very much like the 32nd chapter of Genesis, like Jacob wrestling in the darkness, not knowing what way to go, enacting a level of angst which is genuine, but yet not in any way atheistic. And if that's true, then maybe the atheistic moment is more what Nietzsche thought, which is Saturday after Good Friday, the death itself, not the words on the cross, but the death itself of that God on the cross, and not knowing that Easter Sunday's coming. You know, the terrain of Samuel Beckett, the waiting for Godot and so forth. Now, if that's true, then we might then have to revise what you said about this distinctive feature of the Christian faith somehow being a, a religion in which the atheistic moment is uttered by the God and God's self. And it might actually be very close to um, your own hero, my hero in some ways too, Shelley. You're talking about when you actually look at the life of God, what was it about the emergence of God, that the emergence of man in the life of God that seems to be grounded on a certain kind of derangement and catastrophe in which things are out of joint, almost echoes of Hamlet here, and haven't been, in, and haven't been harmonic since. And that's a very different uh, space, it seems to me, to, to, to reside. I think it cuts much deeper than the, the Chesterton-like uh, mood that I see you uh, following just on, on this on, in the, on, on, the, on the second point uh, here. And let me just end, and I want to say uh, open this up for questions and so forth. But see, what I, what, what I, what, what, when I read you and listen to you and say how fascinating it is to see someone philosophically old-fashioned and politically revolutionary and culturally so playful and personally so charismatic, uh, and having significant <laughs> impact here and around the world. I mean, that's a very rare kind of moment. It is a sense in which it would be fascinating to engage in a uh, Zizekian analysis of Zizek's praxis, uh, and try to understand the emergence of your own discourse and practice at this particular moment, and what kinds of silences and what kinds of uh, uh, insights uh, can be called from uh, what you're doing, but that's a much larger question. But I just throw that out before we open it up. Okay, I will try. Yes, yes, jump right in. No, uh, no I mean, uh, do we applaud to you also? No, I think no, you no, deserve no. it. Yes. No, no, no. I'm really grateful. The only problem I have is that my God to answer you, you know, another. So I will just try to mark some. First, I deeply agree with what you said about uh, this moment of madness, monstrous. And here, mm. it's a much more detailed polemics. I don't, cannot go now into technical details, but in the big debate, you know, about cogito history of madness between Foucault and Derrida. Mm. In spite of all the extreme finesse of Foucault's reading, I basically think that Derrida was right there in detecting a kind of a trans-historical moment of madness in the very core of subjectivity in Cogito, mm -hmm. Cartesian Cogito himself. And here we come to what you mentioned, because already in Kant, but later in Fichte, in Schelling, in Hegel, this explodes again. I think the best sign, index, of the shift from enlightenment to German idealism is the change, fundamental change in the metaphor for the subject. For in enlightenment, the subject is the light, 
of freezing whatever. And you are, when you are haunted by darkness, darkness tries to invade into you from the outside. But with German idealism, with Schelling and Hegel explicitly, they both refer to that mystical lang language, night of the world. Night, darkness is the term for the very excessive, crazy uh, uh, core of subjectivity. And here, not only Schelling, but Hegel should be reread the lesser known Hegel. For example, if you look at Hegel's encyclopedia, third part, philosophy of spirit, things that almost nobody reads, like 